Hey everyone, and welcome to the Anexa Pod, the official podcast for AnexaNet. This is episode number one for March 10th, 2016. I'm your host, Ned Bellavance, Enterprise Architect for Infrastructure Solutions here at AnexaNet, an avid avocado scooper. Here on the Anexa Pod, we talk technology for the enterprise, covering infrastructure, app dev, analytics, and anything else that is shiny. On this episode, we're going to be uh, talking about some recent news, PowerShell a little bit, and then an interview with the CTO of AnexNet, Mr. Doug Paradise. that I've gathered over the last couple weeks. So the first one is a big announcement that just came out, Microsoft Loves Linux Sequel Edition. You may have heard that Microsoft has decided that they love Linux, and they've started support it in many different ways. That includes support for desired state configuration, the release of .NET Core, which is an open source version of .NET that can run on Linux, First Ubuntu and now Red Hat Enterprise Linux are both supported on Azure. There's an agent to um, monitor Linux on SCOM and in OMS, and there's also an agent to back up Linux in DPM. Microsoft is really doing their best to make Linux uh, a focus for their latest set of features. With that in mind, the SQL team has put up a blog post announcing not only the release of uh, Release Candidate Zero for SQL 2016, but also the coming support of SQL on Linux. Hell froze over, madness, cats and dogs living together. It's a private preview today, Hopefully, availability is going to be mid-2017 for the general public, and the first two OSs that they mentioned by name in the blog post, so I'm assuming are the first two they're going to support, are Red Hat and Ubuntu. Hey, have you heard of this crazy thing called hyper-converged infrastructure appliances? You probably have. Well, Cisco's thrown their hat in with their new HyperFlex platform. I first heard about it on the register, uh, which was accidentally posted early and quickly pulled down. It integrates with Cisco's UCS console and servers. It's using the SpringPath data platform, and it integrates with ACI, which is their application-centric infrastructure, or sort of their software-defined networking. It's going to be fighting against a lot of other HCIAs in the marketplace. Uh, you've already got EMC announcing VxRail. HP's got their hyper-converged appliance device. Uh, you've got Nutanix, which is selling like crazy. And you've also got SimpliVity, which up until now was Cisco's partner of choice to do hyperconverged. So I'm not sure what's going to happen with that relationship. But uh, as you can clearly see from all these names, uh, hyperconverged is here to stay and probably just going to continue to grow over the next couple years. Next story is Apple's encryption fight with the FBI continues. You can't have avoided this story. Apple has been asked to decrypt the contents of an iPhone that belonged to a dead terrorist. So the argument goes that they no longer have any rights to the data, so it should be uh, easy to decrypt. However, in order to decrypt it, Apple would have to write special one-time use software to decrypt the information on the phone. And as we all know, once you do it once, the government's going to ask you to do it again, and then a different government's going to ask you to do it. Ad nauseum, next thing you know, your encryption on your iPhone is no better than no encryption at all, basically. Microsoft and Google have jumped in and, and backed Apple's stance, saying that they're not going to unlock the device. So good for them. We'll see what happens with that story as it continues to evolve. Uh, last big bit of news, Riverbed has bought Osito which throws their hat into the SD-WAN ring to compete against solutions such as Cisco's iWAN, uh, Viptela, Talari, Ariaka, and uh, Silverpeak. It's really the next generation of WAN optimization and a way to displace the traditional MPLS with something that uses just generic internet connectivity for your wide area networking. In the magic quadrant for Gartner, Riverbed, Silverpeak, and Cisco are the leaders in WAN optimization. 
and they don't actually have a separate magic quadrant for SD WAN today. There probably will be one in the not too distant future. Basically, the whole idea behind SD WAN is companies that have a traditional MPLS network through a provider, they pay a lot for those dedicated circuits and, you know, they're not getting the most speed on those. Maybe you've got a 5 meg or a 20 meg pipe on your MPLS line, but then you're looking at your internet line and you've got 100 meg, 200 meg for, uh, you know, a fraction of the price. So why can't I use the cheaper generic internet connection for connectivity between all my sites? And the answer is, you know, reliability, your sharing bandwidth on a generic internet line instead of getting dedicated bandwidth uh, and a dedicated circuit. So there's definitely reasons for the traditional MPLS approach. The problem is it's very expensive. You have no visibility into what's happening inside the MPLS cloud. You basically see what the provider wants you to see as opposed to these other solutions, which kind of show you an end-to-end, -end, so you can look at packet latency, you can look at jitter, you can look at, you know, bandwidth, and you can do some dynamic things, you know, dynamically uh, assign priority to different traffic, uh, depending on what the bandwidth allocation looks like. So what I think we're probably going to see here is that slowly organizations are going to move to more of a hybrid model where you maintain your existing MPLS, especially for big data center sites, but at your small business sites, starting to go with more of a hybrid approach to MPLS where you're using your generic internet for most of your connectivity. And then maybe that slowly transitioning the same way that, you know, private cloud versus public cloud, most companies have settled on a hybrid, slowly leaning more towards the public cloud consumption model. That wraps it up for the next bytes. Up next, I'm going to talk about PowerShell. At this point in the podcast, I'm going to be talking about out of the darkness, uh, emerging technologies. And my first topic, you might not think of as an emerging technology, but it's a technology that continues to emerge and loom bigger and bigger on the horizon, and that is PowerShell. For those of you who aren't familiar with PowerShell, it is a scripting shell created by Microsoft based on the Monad Manifesto that was published by Jeffrey Snover. It was first gained real traction with the release of Exchange 2007, which included a huge batch of PowerShell commandlets that could be leveraged to manage Exchange from the command line, which was something that was sorely needed by Exchange admins, especially in larger organizations, because prior to that, there wasn't necessarily a great way to perform bulk actions that weren't built into the GUI. And that's really kind of how PowerShell started gaining more and more traction as new modules were written for PowerShell and made available. And the number of different functions and built-in functionality in PowerShell grew from Windows Management Framework 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, and now the most re recent release, Windows Management Framework 5 and PowerShell 5. The whole point for me has really been there's things that you may want to do that Microsoft has not written a GUI for. And, you know, one thing that Microsoft admins always benefited from was pretty good GUI tools to get things done. But especially when you get to larger organizations, larger data sets, or more complicated tasks, finding a way to automate those tasks usually meant you had to write a convoluted batch script, or you had to write something in VB script that was pretty ugly and not scalable. And it was pretty inconsistent across all the different platforms. So now PowerShell provides the ability to have a consistent platform for creating automation and tying into a whole bunch of different Microsoft products. And basically every single thing that Microsoft has released since Server 2012 has had some form of PowerShell support. And that support is only growing as they release the next generation of 2016 products. So I remember way back in Exchange 2007, a buddy of mine saying to me, Ned, what's the deal with PowerShell? Look, I, I'm an Exchange admin for, you know, a company of 250 people. I don't want to learn how to do things in the shell. You know, I just want to be able to click things in the GUI and get stuff done. I don't have time to learn this because I'm not just an Exchange admin. I'm also the AD admin and the phone system admin 
and the vending machine admin because somehow that fell into my roles and responsibilities. So, you know, what's up with the shell and forcing people to learn it? And he had some really valid points, you know, for a company of 250 people, maybe learning PowerShell didn't make a whole lot of sense to him. But I can say as a consultant, as I've gone around and done things for 10,000 seed or 15,000 seed enterprises, PowerShell is the only way I do most of my things, um, especially in Exchange, but also in Active Directory and, and other regards. You know, anything that I need to do something in a repetitive manner or that needs to change data in a lot of places or I need to collect a lot of information, my first go-to is PowerShell. I saw Jeffrey Snover speak at Ignite 2015, and uh, the one thing that he stressed was, as IT professionals, it's incumbent on us to learn new skills as technologies change and emerge. And just sitting back on your laurels and saying, well, I shouldn't need to learn something other than the GUI, or I shouldn't need to learn something other than what I'm comfortable with, that's just not going to hack in an IT. And, you know, maybe you should go become something else that has a more consistent and not ever-changing landscape. I guess you could be an artisanal candle maker in Colonial Williamsburg, and then your job's not going to change a whole lot for the next 50 years. But if you're in IT and you're an IT professional, you just have to accept that you're going to have to continually evolve your skill set as technology changes over the course of time. And basically what Jeffrey said was, one of the biggest changes coming to Microsoft's sysadmins is the use of PowerShell, the use of um, remote configuration of servers, and this new concept of you know microservices that's layer on a container foundation or you know a tiny server foundation, um, which is why nano server is going to be a big thing in 2016. My advice is if you aren't learning PowerShell, do yourself a favor, go to PowerShell.org, take a look around there. There's a lot of good resources to get started. If you've already started down the PowerShell path, more power to you. Share your experiences. Tweet out to me uh, at Ned1313 or at Anexanet and let me know what you've been doing with PowerShell and how it's enhanced your IT experience. Coming up next, I've got an interview with the CTO of Anexanet, Doug Paradise. We're going to be talking a little about uh, the changing IT landscape out there and, you know, bimodal IT and those types of things. Today by the CTO and EVP of Annexnet, Doug Paradise. How are you doing today, Doug? I'm great, Ned. How are you doing today? Good, good. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you focus on? I've been with Annexnet probably over 10 years. Um, my role here is CTO, which has me doing a lot of different things here, but really interacting with all of our technology practices across the board. Uh, working with our internal delivery teams, helping them craft the technology solutions that we take out to our customers, working with our sales and marketing teams and helping us represent that suite of solutions out to our customers, and then also working with our partners and the rest of the community in understanding what an Exonet does. So it's a, it's a mix of those things and Having to work across all those areas, I'm probably knowledgeable of all and master of none. But you know, I'm uh, I uh, try to stay at a reasonable depth on sort of all the, all the technologies that, that we take out to market. Yeah, no, I know the feeling. So as an IT consultant, I have been almost entirely focused on technology and designing and delivering solutions. But there's a whole strategy and culture component to IT as well. Can you talk a little bit about the shift that you see in IT today? Well, there's really a big change going on in the market, and I don't think this is something that happened in a minute. I think this is something that's been happening for, for a long time where the drivers of the technology are getting closer and closer to that technology. So it's the folks in business in our client organizations, the marketing folks, the chief market is marketing officer, it's the product line owners and the operation owners are getting more directly involved in both selecting 
and buying the technology that they're implementing in their organizations. You know, typically the business owner would go to the technology person in the organization, the technology person would go get help or buy products and services to implement the tech. It's really been shifting over a long time, but now the chief marketing officer or that product line owner is often going directly to get the technology from the combination of service providers and vendors and cloud providers. And I don't want to say skipping technology because the good organizations, they have their IT organization involved, but those business units are controlling the spend in a lot of cases more, much more directly than we've ever seen in the past. Right. So like you said, the, the big spend for new technology and solutions seems to come from business and not necessarily centralized IT. So how can centralized IT uh, stay in the game and avoid the so-called shadow IT? The shadow IT, the, you know, the, the direct consumption of IT around the IT organization by the business. It's, uh, you know, something that, that used to happen um, and now happens really in spades. So IT has typically been thought of as slow, in the way, not cooperative. All you guys care about is security and you take forever to make anything happen. So, you know, that, that is the traditional view of IT and that has driven business users and buyers to go direct around IT and buy through consulting companies like us okay, on occasion, buy from cloud providers directly. And, you know, with the uh, rise of the software as a service platforms out there, it gives them a direct path to, to buy without involving IT. Now, what tends to happen is IT ends up getting the, the tail end of that process and they're getting wagged by the by the dog in, in a lot of these situations where the business will buy it they'll start down a path and then they'll bring in IT at the last minute because they need to integrate security and they need it to run on their both mobile and desktop devices and they need it to be compliant and all those other things that you know need to happen in the end so IT ends up getting backhanded in, in the process if you look at what IT is doing to and can do to be successful, they have to be more nimble. They have to be accepting of the latest technologies and the pace of those technologies. So they can't be like, oh, you know, we only implement things one way and this will be the only way uh, we will help you work with technology because, you know, that'll directly drive them around IT. They need to have preferred platforms and ways to take on new platforms. I think having the IT department be a facilitator and an integrator of all these latest and greatest technologies as opposed to a controller of the technology is what's going to make them successful in being, being a partner with the business. And if they're doing that hand in hand with the business as opposed to trying to be you know, the sole uh, intermediary between the business and the technology, they'll, they'll have much deeper success and be a partner. The reality is a lot of these technologies, cloud-based services, uh, mobile technology, they can allow IT to focus more on the business applications out there and focus less on what I'll call the commodity IT services in the market. So I've been hearing the term bimodal IT a lot. Is that kind of what you consider the bimodal model? Like still have the legacy component, but also embrace these newer technologies? Yes, and many organizations for a long time are going to be bimodal, hopefully not bipolar uh, <laughs> in it. But it's a, it's a model that's going to exist for a long time. There are going to be many internal needs as it uh, relates to, leg I'll call it legacy IT, and that can be true legacy, you know, old mainframe technology or modern mainframe technology. It's going to relate to internal infrastructure, but operating that internal infrastructure in a hyper-converged or at least a converged mode and private cloud type operations. It's supporting the network in your internal environment and how that integrates with these cloud solutions. And very importantly, obviously, the security of technology and intellectual property in, in your organization. So you have to do all that. And at the same time, 
have a seamless integration to the other mode, which is the, the modern technologies, whether it be public cloud infrastructure, public cloud uh, used for hosting custom applications, or whether it's software as a service, you know, really being integrators of those technologies and making it easy for the business to utilize those, but do it in a way that makes it compliant and secure and integrate with that, you know, we'll call it the legacy, the legacy environment as well. So rather than being a roadblock to new developments, instead have your IT department be the champion of new de- technologies. Yes, it, it's, walking, it's walking hand in hand with the business Mm-hmm. into the next generation of technology. The fastest way to be disintermediated and for the business to drive right around IT is to be that roadblock. And it's easier than ever for the business to go around IT. But at the same time, if you do it well and you partner with the business in that process and you let them understand you know, why it's important to do that, how that protects the organization, how that supports security for the organization, how that supports buying power for the organization, how that supports consistency for the organization, all of the types of things that we know are critically important that the IT organization can do. If you work with your, your business to do that, you're going you're gonna to have uh, infinitely more success in getting out there and doing it. Another thing that I hear a lot is DevOps and Agile. And I know Agile was mostly applied to software development for as an alternative to the waterfall technique. Have you seen the Agile methodology being applied to other areas of IT? Absolutely. Agile is an approach that puts ownership of the solution in the hands of the business owners that will eventually be the beneficiaries of the technology or the project. Agile, as a general concept, has been started mostly in software development, but is now being used in business intelligence and analytics solutions. It's being used in evolving infrastructure. So it's being used to solve all kinds of projects, whereas originally it was really sort of a software development approach. So the types of projects have really morphed across the spectrum. The nice thing is that now there are very complementary core technology solutions that allow agile-based approaches to be even more successful and operate faster. You mentioned DevOps in particular. If you think about how agile works, you have a defined backlog of elements of your project. You organize those backlog elements into a sprint. You execute on a sprint and you roll those that feature set out as part of your controlled segments of your project, if you want to simplify it that way. Now you have the ability to execute on those things with DevOps technologies in a much more rapid and automated fashion. So you can control technology environments, you can control core infrastructure, you can control software deployments, and you can integrate all these things at the same time in an automated fashion using DevOps technology. Previously, Agile, when it got to the, all right, let's move this from dev to QA to staging to production, and also, by the way, roll out to customer support and disaster recovery, that was a very manual process. So the, the tools and technologies that are in the DevOps space now let that progression of technology in these agile sprints to happen much more easily, much more quickly, better, stronger, faster, I guess, you know, sort of the... That's a good summary. So, and you heard it here. It's a changing landscape out there, and IT professionals really need to keep up. If you don't adapt and change your skill set, you might get left behind in the metaphorical dust. The people that I've worked with in the past that are the, the best in the industry that we work in are always staying on the forefront of the technology in the space. And you know whether that was the move from, uh, not to get super old school here, but you know from mainframe technologies to distributed systems, from distributed systems to client server solutions, from client server solutions to internet-based technologies, from internet-based technologies to you know mobile and consumer technologies, from that to you know the point that we're at now where 
you know, there are going to be billions and billions of connected devices that are all, you know, operating on our networks around the globe. You know, it, it's really a continuous involvement. And the folks that do the best are the ones that stay on the latest edge of that and adopting cloud-based solutions, adopting mobile technologies, adopting DevOps expertise, adopting agile from your project methodology. These are all things that, you know, are on the forefront right now. And the, the folks that, that do that successfully and are going to be in the best position to deliver on their own careers and help their employers and help their customers be successful out in the market. Last question, and I don't want you to think too hard about this. Just say the first answer that pops into your head, what's your favorite 80s movie? Stripes. Okay. Yes, I would say without a doubt my favorite 80s movie would be Stripes. Great pick. It is a little crazy to go back and look at some of those movies, and <clears throat> very few movies operated at the same. Yeah, it's a good analogy to technology. If you go back and look at those movies, they all operate so slowly, and it is difficult with the pace that we're used to today to watch one of those movies because they're too slow. So. Agreed. Great. Well, thank you, Doug, for uh, taking the time to join and talk to us. Any last words you want to say? Well, uh, I guess the last words on the on the topics that we hit on today are, you know, I- embrace the change in technology, adopt the modern approaches, the modern technology that that's going on in the marketplace. It's it's the best for technologists and to maintain their their career and their edge. It's the continuous wave. That, that we should all be in, in in the marketplace. Great, you heard it. Embrace the change, everyone. Thanks again, Doug. Thanks everyone for joining us today. A special thanks to our guest, Doug Paradise, for taking the time to talk with me. Thanks to Catherine and Patty in the marketing department for helping me pull this together and for making it all look good on the website. Thanks to Lee Rosevere and Professor Click for the music for Anexapod. You can find more information about them in the show notes. Thanks to Anexnet for helping me produce the podcast. If you're looking for a company to help you with your digital strategy or technology needs, then I would highly recommend reaching out to Anexnet to see how they can help. Anexapod is produced under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license, which means you can share it, but don't sell it or change it. And finally, thank you to you for tuning in and listening. Without you, I would just be a lunatic talking in a room to myself. If you'd like to comment on the podcast or contact me in some other way, my Twitter handle is at Ned1313, or you can use the hashtag Anexipod, A-N-E-X-I-P-O-D. Thanks for tuning in, and remember, IT moves pretty fast. If you don't stop to look around once in a while, you could miss it.